welcome to our business uh, lunchtime talk. We're running these business lunchtime talks to see how together we can put the Bible back into business. My name is Trevor Boyd and I'm the minister here in First Rothfriedan Presbyterian Church. And you can find out more about us by visiting our YouTube channel. You can go and you can click down on the subscribe button and then you'll be kept in touch with our weekly updates. Today we're thinking about the leadership of a young man called Daniel and our title for this week is Facing the Facts. Facing the Facts of Dream Number Two. With that in mind, let's turn and read from Daniel. And it's chapter 4 and it's verses 24 to 27. And this sets the scene uh, for Daniel's discussion with Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar has had a dream. He's looking for an explanation. And Daniel comes to explain the second dream. It says, This is the interpretation, O king. And this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the King. They shall drive you from men. Your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make, make you eat grass like the oxen. They shall wet you with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over you, till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. In as much as they gave the command to leave the stump and the roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be assured to you. After you come to know that heaven rules. Therefore, O king, let my advice be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by being righteous and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Perhaps there may be a lengthening of your prosperity. And we finish there at verse 27. There's been a lot going on in the life of Nebuchadnezzar since we last met. Nebuchadnezzar had been made into a god. A huge statue or idol of him had been created and erected for the people to bow down before and worship. But Daniel's three friends, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they had refused to bow down. And so you may well have heard of that famous story of how they were thrown in to the fiery, fiery furnace. And yet they were delivered from it. They weren't killed or burnt. They survived. Now Nebuchadnezzar, sometime later, he has a second dream. It's a dream that torments the life out of him. He doesn't know the explanation. Again, he calls on Daniel to explain what the dream means. You may remember that the last time Daniel interpreted a dream for the king, it wasn't bad news for the king. Daniel was the only person who could give a true and accurate explanation. And Daniel then went on to receive his gift and also to receive his promotion. But this time, it's different. The explanation to the dream that Daniel has is bad news for the king. It's humiliating for him. How, how is the king going to respond? How is he going to take this bad news from Daniel? There are too many of us that want to hear good news. There are very few of us that want to hear a bad news. Never name wanting to deliver bad news. How many times have we put off that difficult conversation with our boss or with an employee? How many times have we put off writing the email or making the telephone call? Even the best of us have procrastinated trying to find the right time when we're supposed to be delivering what is bad news. People, well, people today can still lose their jobs for telling their boss something that they don't want to hear. 
the manager who predicts that sales or profits will be down instead of hitting the company forecast. Well, it's a delicate job for him to make the news known at the board meeting or at the sales meeting. In my career in business, I have also had my share of experiences in this regard. On one occasion, we launched a new product and it was launched firstly in America before it came to Europe. And uh, as we went to uh, our sales meetings, we were getting updates about how this new product was selling so well in America and how there were great expectations uh, for us in Europe. And then it turned out that through some glitch in the system, the sales were being counted twice. So it was a brave sales director who went to the meeting to say that sales were actually 50% of what had been reported on the computer system. Daniel must have thought that whenever he delivers this message, this bad news to King Nebuchadnezzar, well, this is the end of the line. If I say this to the king, he'll tell me to pack my bags and go. And yet Daniel, as we've been learning, was a man of principle. He was a man who had a bit of backbone to him. He had courage. But ultimately, Daniel, as a man of God, had a message from God. And that message had to be delivered irrespective of the consequences. But as we discover in verse 27, Daniel was courteous and Daniel was polite about, about the news. Um, he went to the king and said, therefore, O king, let my advice be acceptable to you. And sometimes we've got the right message to deliver. And it's the same. It's true with me as a minister uh, and it's true in the church. You know, we, we've the best of intentions. We've got the message to deliver, but sometimes we fail in the way we deliver it. We could maybe have a wee bit more grace, a wee bit more love, be a wee bit more courteous. Daniel, we see here, was courteous. He approached the king in a gracious way. And it's a good approach for each of us to have, no matter, no matter what our role is in business or indeed in life, there's no harm in being courteous, irrespective of whether we have bad news or good news. If we show respect and are courteous to people, then the people tend to be more receptive, whether it's good or bad for them. So Daniel, he delivered the message. And Daniel also indicated to the king that the king may be able to avoid the consequences of this bad news or the consequences of the dream if he took particular actions. So Daniel asked the king to break off, to give up his sins by being righteous. And he asked the king or told the king as well that if he gave up his iniquities or sins and showed mercy to the poor, then perhaps there may be a lengthening of his prosperity. Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had been doing what he pleased. He just went about his everyday business. He wasn't bound by rules. He was the king, so he did what pleased him. He had this message from, from Daniel, and Daniel kept his job. But ne King Nebuchadnezzar didn't take the advice and change his ways. And so 12 months down the line, we're told later, 12 months came to pass and Nebuchadnezzar was walking on the palace roof and said to himself, by my mighty power and the glory of my majesty, he acknowledged that in his mind, he had built mighty Babylon. And as the words slipped off his lips, his authority was taken from him. He was asked by God to clear his desk, leave his office with immediate effect. Nebuchadnezzar, as we said, thought he could do what he liked. He thought that he was above the law, that he was a law unto himself. And he ignored the guidelines of God. He ignored the message, the news that Daniel brought to him. 
And the Bible tells us that it is God who puts kings on thrones and it is God who removes kings from thrones. It is God who allows people to build business empires or for them to watch over their demise. Alongside that lies a need for us to confess our sins and to acknowledge our wrongdoing to God and to be kind and caring to those who are oppressed and less well off. In many ways, we, we, could, we could say Nebuchadnezzar was singing the Babylonian equivalent of Frank Sinatra song, I Did It My Way. He was singing it on the rooftop when he was cut off from his people and from his empire, just as the dream had promised. Nebuchadnezzar didn't want to acknowledge that he was only able to do it because God enabled him to do it. No, that would make him sound weak. But the same is true for you and me. We naturally have an inclination to replace God with some type of power idol, thinking that it will provide security, it will give us deep satisfaction. So some power idols are political ideologies or political messiahs. An ideology we perceive to be the answer to society's problems. For example, Communism was an ideology. It was built on noble ideals. It was classless, it was stateless, and it was oppression-free society. That was the aspiration. And yet it had one major and daring flaw. It rejected the fact that all people are sinners. And truth be told that as we reflect back, many people have actually been oppressed by communist regimes. On the other hand, many thought capitalism was the best solution for dealing with poverty and injustice. But then we have discovered that capitalism can just make the rich richer and the poor poorer. And just as in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, our power idols, whoever or whatever they are, will come to nothing. If you can remember back to 2008 or during that time of the uh, global financial recession. In America, there were a string of suicides. Suicides by wealthy and powerful individuals. The chief financial officer of Freddie Mac hanged himself. An executive of Beer Stearns jumped out of his office window to his death. When the, the rock of the financial recession smashed their hopes, these people, it appears, had nothing left to live for. And so today, as we journey through life, uh, as we pour our all into our businesses, what is our hope in? What is our true hope? What is our sure foundation? Because we know life won't last forever. Indeed, our businesses may well outlive us. But we won't last forever. It's hard for successful people like you. It's hard to admit that it hasn't been all you're doing. And yet successful people are called based on Nebuchadnezzar's story to acknowledge that it is God's doing. And that God has been pleased to use you in this adventure of growing and developing a business or indeed a business empire. So let's remember that we don't do it all ourselves. Let's remember that God has empowered us and allowed us and given us the privilege of being part of the adventure that he has planned. So how about if we put the Bible back into business how about if we do what Daniel asked of Nebuchadnezzar, if we renounce our sins, if we do what is right and we look after the oppressed or well off. It's hard for successful people to come to the point where they admit it's all God's doing. And God was pleased to involve them in the adventure. 
So how about if we put the Bible back into business, if we renounce our sins, just as Daniel asked Nebuchadnezzar, if we renounce our sins, if we do what is right, and we look after the oppressed and less well-off. Something to think about until we see you again in the same time, in the same place, next week. Bye for now.